Thank you, everyone, for being such a patient audience during these two days of power-packed, engaging, and informative sessions. As the saying goes, good things are generally saved for the last. And uh, as a penultimate session of this glorious NISC 2020, we have Professor Sunil Gupta, the Edward W. Carter Professor of Business Administration and co-chair of the executive program on driving digital strategy at Harvard Business School, joining us for a plenary on the topic, reinventing business. For the kind attention of the audience, you may type in your questions in the chat box whenever it is available to you. And at the end, uh, if at all time permits, Professor will be more than happy to take a couple. Professor Gupta's current research is in the area of digital technology and its impact on consumer behavior and firm strategy. The primary goal of his research is to understand how digital technology is disrupting existing industries and how incumbents should transform their businesses in this new environment. His research has been well recognized and his books and articles have won several national and international awards. Professor Gupta is an advisor to several startup firms and consulted with many companies. And as a business expert, he has frequently appeared on several national and international radio and television programs. As Justin mentioned during this session, Professor Gupta will throw some light and share his knowledge on some of the following, how to redefine and reinvent your business for the digital era, why competitive advantage no longer comes from making your product better or cheaper? Why industry boundaries are blurring and how do you compete in this new world? And how do you identify new opportunities for growth? I must mention that I was a student of Professor Gupta at Harvard Business School's Senior Executive Leadership Program. And I thoroughly enjoyed his classes that were so insightful and engaging. Therefore, it gives me immense pleasure in welcoming him to talk to us about reinventing business. Over to Professor Sunil Gupta. Thank you, Fred. It's a pleasure to be here. I want to thank uh, you and as well as all the organizers of NASCOM, uh, Samir Jain, Sangeeta Raj, and everybody else who's put in tremendous effort to make this happen. And I'm an Indian at heart. I grew up in India although I've been away from India for the last 30 years. Uh, so in the next 20 minutes or so, I want to share at least my learnings from working with hundreds of companies around the world. Uh, and for the last 15 years, I've been working with the companies to see how their technology is transforming their businesses and what can we learn from them. Um, and the companies uh, that I'm talking about, many of them were startups at one point in time, but they've grown to be big. Um, so companies like Amazon, which 25 years ago were just a small startup in the uh, small apartment of Jeff Bezos in Seattle, and now it's a $1.6 trillion company. So how did a small company from a small room in Seattle become one of the largest companies in the world? And by the way, Amazon is growing every quarter for more than 20% top line growth. Same thing with Paytm. I worked with Vijay Shekhar Sharma in India and saw the witness, the growth of Paytm. Same thing for Flipkart. I worked with the Bunsels. I worked with Ritesh Agarwal at Oyo. And it's an amazing story in India as to how these companies, which started small, became somewhat uh, medium-sized businesses and they grew tremendously. So what I hope to do in the next 20 odd minutes is share with you these three things, which is how the rules of strategy have changed and, and why what we learned 20 years ago may or may not apply how competitive boundaries are changing, and how can you find new opportunities for growth? So let's start with the first one, how do the rules of strategy have changed? And, and take the example of Amazon. And if you think about, go back to 25 years ago, when Jeff Bezos started that as a small business. He basically started this as a books and electronic store. And the competition was the traditional brick and mortar. What was the competitive advantage at the point in time for Amazon? Very simply, it was, uh, you don't have to fight the traffic of uh, Delhi or Mumbai. You can order it from the comfort of your home. So convenience was number one. Number two was lower price. Why was the price low? Because I don't have the physical 
infrastructure or bricks and mortar, so I don't have the fixed cost. And number three, I have huge variety because I don't have the physical constraint of a store. So that was the value proposition of Amazon, and it became reasonably big. But even as a small and medium enterprise, it didn't stay there. Very soon, it expanded to become a marketplace and started competing with people like eBay. Now, what exactly is the marketplace? As you very well know, marketplace is where Amazon started inviting third-party sellers to come, small and medium enterprises, to come and sell on its or Amazon's platform. Now, if you think and pause for a moment, uh, you sort of say, why is Amazon doing it? Well, Walmart does not invite small retailers to enter Walmart and put up a shop within Walmart. So why is Amazon doing it? In fact, there was a lot of debate inside Amazon whether we should do it or not, because by inviting third-party sellers on the marketplace, effectively, Amazon is also competing with them. And it might lose business to the third-party sellers who might actually offer better products or cheaper products. But there are many good reasons to encourage that competition. Firstly, it provides huge amount of variety uh, that people can find anything. So the long tail, so-called long tail products. Uh, secondly, because of the internal competition with these third-party sellers, the prices go down, which is always good for the customer. Uh, and perhaps one of the most important reasons for opening up a marketplace is this notion that by inviting these third-party sellers, you have a huge variety of products on the platform. And because you have huge variety of products, uh, customers don't have to go anywhere. So custom, more customers come to the platform because they can find everything. And as more customers come to the platform, more sellers come to the platform because that's where the customers are. So it becomes a flywheel momentum or flywheel effect where more customers drive more sellers and more sellers drive more customers. In other words, this is what we call network effects. And the beauty of network effects is the winner take call. In other words, Amazon becomes so big, it's very hard for a new player to compete with them, even if they are better than Amazon in many of the services they provide. But Amazon didn't stop there. And it went on to then launch AWS, uh, which is the Amazon Web Services. And now suddenly it's competing with IBM, Microsoft, and Google. And you, you sort of say, well, what is Amazon doing? It was a bookseller. Why is a retail online retailer get into cloud servicing. It doesn't make sense. And again, the reason why this happened is because once Amazon started Marketplace and the third party sellers who wanted to do e-commerce, they didn't know exactly how to do web services. They didn't know how to get uh, storage space. They didn't know how to actually connect all the dots. And Amazon says, I need to help my customers. And if I can help the customers, so I started by building the, the technology to help the customers. And once they built that muscle, it says, hey, I can actually launch a completely new business called AWS. And by the way, the financial market for at least seven, eight years was saying Amazon is doing something terribly wrong. AWS is not its business. It should not be in that business. It's a retailer. It should stay in retail. But Jeff Bezos says, no, no, no. I'm going to do that because I know what I'm doing and I'm helping my customers, but also that, that help can be converted into a new, completely new business, which of course becomes a billion dollar business. And of course, as you know, it started getting into hardware by Kindle. Actually, Kindle came long before iPad. Why did it do Kindle? Again, following the customer by saying, if the customers are moving from buying physical books to reading books on online, or then I will provide a platform for them to read it. So in other words, Kindle is a razor in order to sell the blades, which is the books. Point being, Kindle is not where Amazon is going to make money. Amazon is going to make much more money on the books. So I will sell Kindle cheap in order to make money on, on the eBooks. And then as you know, it went on to create video streaming which, with Netflix became a competition. And perhaps the most controversial thing is it got into making its own TV shows and movies that many of you are familiar with. And now Amazon's competition is Hollywood. Now, Amazon is spending close to $6 billion today on making its own movies. And you sort of say, why is Amazon doing that? It's a retailer. Why is a retailer making movies? I don't know about you, but when I was in the MBA program a long time ago, I was told strategy is about focus. This doesn't look like focus to me. Clearly, Jeff Bezos missed that class because otherwise he would have focused only on online retailing. And the reason why he's building the studio is because of the Prime. And many of you may be Prime members. And when Amazon started the Prime membership, at least in the US, it was $80 and the only benefit customers will get is free shipping any, for anything that you buy from Amazon. 
Now, all of us are smart. If that was the only benefit, you and I will make the calculation in our head that how many shipments do I expect next year? And is the $80 worth it or not? And many of us might say, well, I'm not sure whether it's worthwhile or not, so let's not get into paying $80 up front. Amazon, Jeff Bezos does not want you to do that math in your head. So he says, I'm going to throw in a few unique movies that you can't find anywhere. I can throw in some music. And now you can't compare the value of Amazon Prime with anything else. And why is Prime so important to Amazon? Because right now there are 150 million Prime members worldwide for Amazon Prime. On an average, if they pay $100 per year, which of course is much less in different countries, uh, that's $15 billion in my pocket even before I open my store. And by the way, the prime customers buy three to four times more than the non-prime customers, uh, and they're also less price sensitive. In fact, Jeff Bezos has gone on to say publicly that every time we win a Golden Globe Award for one of our shows, we sell more shoes. <laughs> so. What is a studio? Studio is really another razor to sell shoes, the blade. He's not going to make money from studios. He's going to make money from selling you goods on his online platform. And this is the complementarity. So I can go on with all these other components. Uh, but, but the point here I, I want to say is how are the rules of strategy changed? And if you go back uh, again, I go back to my MBA days. I did my MBA from my Ahmedabad, and I remember we used to read Michael Porter's book on comparative strategy. Uh, now, Michael Porter is my colleague, so I have to be careful what I say. But if I were to distill what we learned about comparative strategy, how you win in the market, what we were told is either your product has to be better or cheaper. Product differentiation or cost leadership, right? And that, at some level, makes sense. But that inherently assumes that we are selling the product to one customer at one time. In other words, I'm selling you my car, my car is better or cheaper. What happens if I'm selling you multiple products? Well, that's when you have razor and blade. That's when I sell Kindle cheap in order to make money on the books. Now you might say, well, razor and blade have been around forever. What's different today? I think what is different today is razor could be in one industry and blade could be in a completely different industry. Razor could be movies and Blaze could be shoes. Think about it for a moment. If Amazon wants to sell loans, give, get into banking and offer loans to small and medium enterprises, how can it compete with banks? And I would argue Amazon can decide to offer loans to SMEs at such a low rate that banks will never be able to match it. Why? Because Amazon doesn't have to make money on loans it will make money when these SMEs do more transactions on his platform and Amazon gets commission on that platform. In other words, the moment you make somebody's core business, bank's core business, your razor, they can't compete. On the other axis, when you're selling the same product to multiple customers, that's when you have the network effects. So think about WhatsApp. If you are the only person in the world using WhatsApp, what's the value of WhatsApp? Not much, unless you love yourself. Now, as more and more people use WhatsApp, the value of WhatsApp increases without changing the product. In other words, it's not about the product. So connecting multiple products or connecting multiple people, digital economy is all about connection. And of course, the ideal thing is if you connect both the products and the customers, that's what WeChat in China has done, is built a platform which is for free messaging service. And on top of that, now all Chinese do all the transactions on WeChat and that's where the, the WeChat makes money. Now, one of the questions I'm asked by many companies and when I talk to them is, well, this may be fine for technology companies, but does it one work for traditional companies? So let me give an example of a traditional company, Peloton, uh, which is started by one of our graduates uh, a few years ago as a small company, and they were making exercise bikes. And this is an expensive exercise bike for about $3,000 that you buy to do workout at home. If you don't want to go to the gym, you don't have the time or the motivation to go to the gym. And Peloton CEO could basically position his bike by saying my bike is better or my bike is cheaper. Clearly it's not cheaper, so he has to sell on the basis of my bike is much better. But the key insight that he had is when you go to the gym and come back from the gym, you don't come back and say, oh, I, the bike I went on exercising was great. You talk about the environment around you, you talk about the instructor, you talk about the exercise routine, you don't talk about the equipment. 
So I am focusing on the equipment, but the customer doesn't care about the equipment. He cares about the exercise. He cares about the ambience. And what they miss at home is the ambience of the gym, the motivation that you derive from all the other people around you. So he said, how can I create that? And how can I leverage the learnings from Amazon to apply it to Peloton? How can I create the razor and blade for Peloton? And that's what he started thinking about. So rather than simply focusing on the product, he says, let me build the razor for my product. And my compliment is I can get video on demand services. So you feel like you have a personal instructor at home, even though you are not in the gym. And very soon he started connecting all the Peloton users. So if I go on my bike at 6 a.m. in the morning, I could be connected with 200 people around the world in real time who are exercising at the same time. And I have my really virtual gym that motivate the other people. The Fred could be motivating me because he's pedaling faster. And of course, I can't let Fred beat me. So I'm pedaling even faster. Now, if a competition comes in with a better bike, it doesn't matter because Peloton is not fighting on the basis of the product itself. In other words, the definition of competition has been changed. And I think in the digital economy, you need to figure out how do you connect products and how do you connect customers? That's where the real advantage comes from. So that's my first lesson. The second uh, thing I wanted to highlight is how the definition of competition has changed. Now, most of us think of competition in the traditional industry boundaries. If I'm a bank, my competitors are banks. If I'm a healthcare company, my competitors are the healthcare companies. If So in fact, I talked to uh, many senior executives of Abbott, which is a medical device company, and I asked them, these are very senior people, uh, who are your competitors? And the typical answer they give me is the other uh, medical device and, and pharma companies. And then you ask them again, okay, think broadly, who are your computer competitors? Who are really competing with you? And very soon you realize a lot of these different competitors. So Apple is very much into healthcare. The iPhone is really a medical device now. It can monitor your blood glucose, it can monitor your blood pressure, it can monitor your heart murmurs, it can monitor, and they're working with uh, the Stanford University to figure out that if you are a Parkinson's, if you have Parkinson's disease and you're holding an iPhone, the tremor in your hands can detect whether you're having some, some seizure, right? So suddenly an iPhone is competing with Abbott's medical devices. Google, on the other hand, is taking advantage of what it knows best, which is data. And it is working with some of the largest hospitals in UK to use this data algorithms to predict which patients need the intervention the most. And as you might have read recently in the reports, the deep mind of Google has basically able to figure out the protein foldings, which the biology scientists have not been able to do for the last 50 years. So suddenly, if I'm Abbott, I have to be concerned about Apple, Google, and all the other tech giants because the devices may become commodities. What will be really valuable is the data and how you leverage the data. And so if I'm Abbott, I should start thinking about becoming more of a technology company rather than a device company. Same thing in streaming services. If you look at Netflix and ask yourself who are Netflix competitors, of course, all these are different competitors of Netflix. But the interesting thing is when you have competitors from very different industries, they have a very different motivation. So as we talked about Amazon and the Prime Video, Amazon does not make money from offering you with Prime Video for free because it makes money when you buy products on its online commerce. So Netflix is facing a very different competition because Netflix has to make money from the videos, from the TV shows that they make. How can he compete with somebody who's offering the similar product for zero price? And that's where the competition becomes different. Apple, which launched an Apple TV Plus, what's Apple's motivation? Apple's motivation is not so much to make money on the TV shows that it produces. Apple motivation is for you to buy it Apple devices, the iPhones and the iPads, and it, it helps, the TV shows help Apple to lock you in the, the Apple family. So the motivation of all these players are different and why is that important? Because the rules of the game that you're playing is very different. You're not competing on the same playing field. And therefore, you need to think differently when people from outside your industry come to fight you. So I think you need to think broadly as to who are your real competitors. And my third uh, message is to how do you find new opportunities in the world of technology? Uh, again, let me give you a couple of examples of how you can do that. 
One is to leverage your existing capabilities, capabilities that you might have built for your existing business. So take the case of Amazon again. As, as you all know, Amazon started with this online retail business. And then very soon, it decided to go into marketplace, just like we said earlier, because it wanted to increase the product variety. Uh, but we also talked about once the third party sellers came on his platform, they needed help. They needed IT help to get them to start the, doing e-commerce. And based on that, Amazon developed this capability of IT infrastructure. And once it had built the infrastructure, that's the muscle it built, it launched a completely new business called AWS, which is a multi-billion dollar business. Take another example. Once Amazon built the marketplace for third party sellers, now it has millions of products on its website. Once it has millions of products, now it has another problem. How do, you, how do consumers find the product they are looking for? So I have millions of items on my, on my marketplace, but if as a consumer, I want to find a particular product, how do I find it? So it needed to build a search algorithm. Uh, to help consumers find that. Once it built that capability to help the existing business, which is marketplace, Amazon says, hey, I know how to do search. How do I leverage this muscle to build a completely new business? And now Amazon is one of the largest advertisers competing with Google and Facebook. In fact, Amazon has made $5 billion on advertising last year. And there are in the US, more searches for products start on Amazon rather than on Google. So if you ask Google CEO, who are they most worried about in their business? They're most worried about Amazon, not Facebook. Take another example. Amazon clearly wants to be efficient in warehousing because it, it needs to ship you all the boxes and all the products. So it wants to make warehousing very efficient. As a result, it employs lots of technology in their warehouses, right? Once it deploys all the technology, one of the technology it employs is computer vision, where you think about simply in simple terms, the cameras all around the warehouses that capture where different items are, where different bins are, so the robots can come pick up those items and drop you in the box. But once it built that muscle of identifying which items are where in the warehouse, that's the capability or muscle it built, Amazon says, how can I leverage that muscle? How can I leverage that capability to launch a completely new business and as many of you know, Amazon is now testing the Amazon Go stores, which are cashierless stores. So imagine a store which, where there's absolutely no human being, uh, like a small store, you walk in the store, you're an Amazon Prime customer, Amazon already has your credit card on file, everybody has a smartphone, they the moment you enter, the cameras recognize you, uh, you pick up an item, you walk out, no interaction with anybody, your item is already charged to your Amazon credit card. Uh, if you don't like it, if you want to return it, you come back, put the item back on the shelf. Again, item is uh, price is credited to your account. Amazon is already testing with more than 20 stores in the United States. And I can guarantee you, Amazon is going to revolutionize physical retailing, which is more than a trillion dollar business in the future. So it didn't think of retail. It thought of how do I learn what I learned in my warehouse to get into a completely new business. Same thing with Alibaba. Alibaba started Taobao, which was uh, um, an exchange where buyers and sellers can sell each other some stuff. But the problem in, in China, just like in India, is buyers didn't trust the sellers. I may ask for an iPhone, but what if I get a bar of soap instead, right? How do I know whether I'm gonna get the right product? To solve that problem, Alibaba started an escrow account which basically means that buyer is not sending the money directly to the seller. Buyer is putting the money in an escrow account with Alibaba. And once the buyer is satisfied that they got the right item from the seller, Alibaba will release that money from the escrow account to the seller. But once Alibaba learned how to handle the escrow account and the money, they say, oh, I now have a new capability of handling money. So how do I leverage that capability? And now Alibaba is one of the largest wealth managers in the world. So the message here is think about your core capability, the core muscle that you have built, and don't limit yourself to thinking about this muscle can be used only in the same business that you're in, but can I use this muscle for a completely new business where this might be a competitive advantage? Another way to find new opportunities is by leveraging data. And I think in almost every business now, data is becoming the new oil as everybody says now. Uh, take the example of MasterCard. 
when Ajay Banga became the CEO of MasterCard about 10 years ago, less than 5% of the business was from services. 95% of the, their revenue used to come from transaction, the, the commission on the transactions. But what Ajay basically said is, hey, we get lots of data based on the transactions. Billions of transactions are being done on MasterCard every day. How can we leverage that data? Because we know so much about the purchases of consumers. We know about the, how the economy is humming, where we can predict the forecast, the GDP of a country. We can figure out, tell the retailers what the next quarter will look like for you based on consumer spending. So there's a lot of insight in that. So he said, how can you leverage that information? And now leveraging that data, they launched these, this is a, what you see are a few examples of the services they've launched. Uh, and now more than 25% of their business comes from services. And the final thing I will say is by leveraging insights. And this is an example of this uh, company Revigo that I'm sure many of you know uh, in India. And I've talked to Deepak Gurk uh, to find out as to how did this come up with this idea of Revigo. And what he told me is that Revigo idea came from the fact that the demand for e-commerce means the demand for trucking is also huge because packages have to move. But surprisingly, even though the demand is high, the supply of truck drivers is short. There's a real shortage of truck drivers. And that's sort of odd as to why people are not willing to become truck drivers when there are lots of jobs and actually wages are very high. Uh, so he went on a, a listening tour to the small villages and towns where most of these truck drivers come from to understand why are people not signing up to become truck drivers when there are good money to be had as a, as a, uh, as, as a job. And what he found was that every person in the village, the person in the village basically, they all think the truck driver is the 37th cost. I don't even know that there were 36 costs in India, but I learned that this is actually the lowest of the lowest cost in, in uh, at least in people's mind. And why is that? And the reason was because by nature of the job, these truck drivers are always on the road. Uh, so because they're always on the road, they get into all kinds of bad habits. They get into bad habits of drinking, drugs, prostitution, you name it. As a result, no father in the village wants their son to become a truck driver. No father in the village wants their daughter to marry a truck driver. In other words, it's not an economic problem, it's a social problem. Once he had that insight, he says, how do I solve that problem? And he says, the only solution is to send the truck driver back home every night. Now, that's a pretty problem because if you're moving a truck from Delhi to Mumbai, it may take three or four days. How do you send the truck driver back home every night so that he doesn't get into bad habits? And his solution was a relay system. So between Delhi and Mumbai, I build pit stops every four hours. So a driver drives from point A to point B for four hours, drops the truck there, picks up a truck from point B and brings it back to point A and sleeps in his bed in the night. Another driver picks up the truck from point B, takes it to point C for four hours and brings another truck back from C to B. Now, again, this is like literally a relay system. In order to do that, he had to build all these pit stops. And there's a huge technology behind this because you have to match the drivers and the trucks so that the truck is not waiting for the driver or vice versa. So there's a lot of technology behind this, but the idea and insight is very simple to send the driver back home every night. And now it's more than a billion dollar company. Started with nothing a few years ago and is now a huge company. And in fact, now they are competing with air freight because they can send the truck. Truck is more, better utilized because truck driver is not sleeping for eight hours on the truck while he's the only person going from Delhi to Mumbai. Now they are only driving for four hours. So utilization of truck has increased. Drivers are happy and it's, they're just growing quite tremendously. Now, of course, with COVID, things have slowed down. But uh, I think this is, again, a great example of leveraging insight to get into a new business. So let me just sort of end by saying, think about how competitive advantage may not only, so having a good product or low cost is a necessary but not sufficient condition to compete. Think about your competition outside your traditional industry and think about how can you leverage the existing muscle that you have into a very, very different business. So, so thank you, appreciate your time and hopefully give you some some thoughts to think about. Thank you, uh, Professor Gupta. Awesome insights. And uh, we thoroughly enjoyed it. 
Um, in the interest of time, I think um, um, we would not take any uh, Q&A for now, but then I'm sure all of the audience got what they um, were looking for. Thank you so much for joining us at NISC 2020. And um, I wish uh, all the uh, audience uh, the next few minutes of uh, good sessions. And um, we'll wrap it up here for reinventing business. Thank you, Professor Gupta. Thank you, Fred.